Welcome, everybody, um, to the uh, COA Book Club. We're very, very honored today to have Rabbi and Special Envoy Arye Lightstone speaking about his new book, which was just published yesterday. And without further ado, I will turn this over to Rabbi Lightstone. Okay, fantastic. Uh, it is uh, it's extremely nice to see. I recognize so many of the names. Uh, here and I just have to tell you it, it it's heartwarming because I've missed all of you uh, since uh, since leaving my professional capacity. Uh, you know, I had a chance to spend a lot of time with my family and with the business and various different opportunities. And writing this book has given me a chance to come back to what what I love in addition to my family, which is strengthening the U.S. Israel relationship. And I know this is what so many of you spend uh, your waking hours, your philanthropic dollars, your efforts. Uh, on and uh, and so it's so nice to feel like uh, I'm back home. So I appreciate the uh, the ZOA Book Club for uh, for hosting. I did write a book. Uh, the book came out yesterday, and the book is called Let My People Know. And uh, and before I say anything about the book, uh, other than encourage everybody to buy it, of course. Uh, but before I say anything specifically about the book, uh, there are two incredibly important parts of the book that, that if you read none of it, or if you take away nothing from this book club other than this, please take away the following two pieces. Number one is in my introduction, I speak about something uh, that I remember when I was fourth grade. I don't know how many of you remember what you did when you were fourth grade, but when I was in fourth grade and I remember the Shabbat that I was reading this book, it was about interesting sports statistics. And, uh, and it spoke about Ch Wilt Chamberlain when he scored 100 points in the game. And uh, when he scored 100 points in the game, the book mythically, because I later found out the story was not true, uh, described one of the players on his team who scored two points and who was interviewed in the locker room after the game. And he was interviewed and was told, how are you going to remember this historic evening? And he replied back to him, how am I going to remember this historic evening? Let me tell you how everybody will remember this historic evening. It was the night that Wilt and I combined to score 102 points. And I share that story because uh, for four years, uh, any part of history that I was lucky enough to be a part of, any small role that I was able to play, uh, any opportunity that I had was purely because my boss who took a chance on me, Ambassador David Friedman, uh, he was the one who has the relationship with uh, with the president, with the secretary of state, with Jared Kushner, et cetera. And he graciously allowed me into the room. He allowed me into the opportunity. He allowed me to prove myself. And, and I spent every waking hour uh, for the better part of four years trying to repay both his trust, but the trust of the United States of America. And if you look at history, there are a lot of interesting ambassadors. There are a lot of ambassadors who do some things, but it's extremely rare where policy is crafted from an embassy 6,000 miles away from our capital of Washington, D.C. And I think when history looks at that, they'll see Ambassador David Freeman has been unique in that thing. And, and it was his relationship with the president. It was his relationship with Jared, with Avi, with Mike Pompeo, with Nikki Haley, and, and, and the list goes on and on that made him unique. And only because he was unique did I have an opportunity uh, to have some uniqueness to, to my job. That's point number one. Point number two is that we almost did not take this job. Uh, and uh, and I don't know how upset I would be right now if I was listening uh, to somebody else give this speech and likely pretty upset. Uh, and it was all because my wife uh, had the the correct perspective and attitude about it. And And I'll just give you this vignette that did not make it into the book because I didn't want to publicly embarrass her, but really I'd like to publicly praise her for a moment. Uh, when it's not a secret, I addressed this in the book, I supported Marco Rubio in the primaries, and then I immediately supported Ted Cruz in the primaries. I, I was not uh, on Team Trump until the general election. Uh, and uh, and even then, I, I was I was less. It was the, I just hadn't known him. Um, uh, and uh, and uh, by the time Marco dropped out, so we went, I bought a business, we had a baby, we had a house. The, the time was pretty strange in the Lightstone household. And uh, and when Ambassador Friedman offered us a position, uh, I came home and told my wife we had a 10-day-old baby of which of the 10 days, nine of them had been spent in the hospital. So it's not like we were under traditional normal circumstances. And uh, And I remember on a Thursday coming home and telling my wife, hey, we got offered this great job. 
but my wife and I have a philosophy that the right opportunity at the wrong time must be by definition the wrong opportunity. So I said, look, it's your right to know what the opportunity was, but it's the wrong time for both of us to even contemplate and have a normal conversation. So I'm, I'm going to call David after Shabbat and tell him thank you, but no thank you. And my wife nodded along vigorously because, again, we had spent the last nine nights sleeping on hospital cots, so we weren't interested in having a philosophical conversation. Friday night after we had Shabbat dinner at home, we were finally with all of our children at home in our new home. And we go to sleep and my wife wakes up at around three in the morning to nurse the baby. And she wakes me up and says, Arye, our entire life philosophy is incorrect. So that's a funny conversation to have at three in the morning with somebody who's now sleeping in her bed for the first time in 10 days. And I said, what is it that you mean, sweetheart? And she goes, the philosophy of right opportunity at the wrong time equals the wrong opportunity gives us too much credit. I said, what do you mean? She says, God opens the door. It's your job to figure out how to walk through it. So when the right opportunity strikes, if you wait for the right time, you might spend the rest of your life waiting for the right opportunity. It's our job to take the right opportunity and make it the right time. And, and I like to begin that because without her saying that, I'd likely have been the person who said thank you, but no thank you. I'd probably have a much larger real estate portfolio today, uh, but I would have played a, a, a much smaller role in, in what I think was a really historic time. So, okay, so those, those are two things that I wanted to... I don't want to say get out of the way because that's the incorrect emphasis. That is the foundation of which the entire book, Let My People Know, is, uh, is written under. So now what does it mean, let my people know? Let my people know is written for one purpose and one purpose only, and it's to translate an America first policy in terms of practical implications of what the Trump policies meant. I don't claim to have written any of the policies. I do claim to have implemented a lot of the policies, and I was blessed to be able to do so. And my argument is, is that there are two ways that the United States has looked at the Middle East. We'll call it pre-Trump and post-Trump, so PT and PT, and then you've got T. Uh, President Trump, because of David Friedman and Jared Kushner and Mike Pompeo on the list is very long, Avi Berkowitz and so many more, looked at the region very differently. And I make the argument that when all of these people who are now household names came into their positions, they were ridiculed by the mainstream press as being unqualified. And my argument is it was specifically because of their lack of what our experts call qualifications that made them so successful in that which they did. And what I try to do over the course of the book of let my people know is to let you know, because you're my people, Americans, what it means to be part of the foreign policy think tank echo chamber and what the courage and conviction and intellect and strategy was of those select leaders who were able to extricate themselves from that. So in order to understand how the problem was solved, you have to know how the problem is. And, and Liz, I'm, I'm just assuming I'm talking. You want to ask questions? I'm, I'm happy to do this however you want. I got a thumbs up from Alan. Okay, as long as that's no, no, the thumb. And, no, yeah. it's, fine. it's fine. I'm fine. We'd, we'd love you to speak a little more about the book, and then we'll turn it over for questions. Fantastic. Right. Okay. Oh, great. great. So, okay, perfect. So the, the premise is, is that, you know, we have these things that nobody really pays that much attention to out, outside of ZOA. And I credit ZOA because you fight about everything. And a lot of people roll their eyes and say, just leave it alone. This isn't a meaningful detail. And the answer is every detail is meaningful because in the course of lots of details, they add up and it creates a preponderance of evidence. Now, if one of those pieces of evidence is wrong and all of the other pieces of evidence are built upon that evidence, so it turns out that we have all of our evidence wrong. And we have these reports that are called the Human Rights Report and the International Religious Freedom Report. And we're obligated by Congress to write these reports. It's not just the embassy in Israel, uh, uh, but it's, it's every embassy and every conflict that we have around the world writes these reports. The fact is none of us read any of them other than ours. And none of them make any news other than ours, but the, all, all, every embassy in the world is, is required to then those reports get sent back to Congress and to our intelligence services and to the State Department. And what winds up happening is the opposition to Israel uh, is so well organized and so well funded that there are countless NGOs, non-governmental organizations who write reports on what happens in Israel. And those reports, not, th there's no professional test that you need to take to work for an NGO. There's none whatsoever. There's probably an ideological test that you have to take, but there certainly is no professional test that you need to take. And they sit there and they'll write reports, and then they'll write more reports, and then they'll write more reports. And Congress requires that the embassies take the publicly available reports and collate them 
into a book that goes back to Congress, our intelligence and State Department. So just understand this. The Congress has outsourced our foreign policy making to NGOs that have no requirements or restrictions in terms of how their reports come out. So we get these reports. They say horrendous things about Israel because 99.8% of the NGOs in Israel are specifically there in order to say terrible things about Israel. The United States of America, with your taxpayer dollars, writes these reports. They edit these reports and they publish these reports. And then the NGOs take these reports to their funders and say, look how successful we are. We've created American foreign policy because they're part of American embassies. Uh, reports that go back again to our intelligence and State Department and the White House, they get more funding and they write more reports. And this goes in a circular uh, uh, firing squad. And the first thing Ambassador Friedman had me do, it was the least glamorous thing I ever could have imagined doing. And he says, read all of the reports. I said, oh, that's fun. And I read all of the reports. And then I read more of the reports. And he said, figure out how you can fix those reports. And it was very difficult to do because there are three full-time officers at the embassy who all they do is write these reports. And I'm not saying that the reports that we published finally in year number four were good reports, but they were more intellectually honest within the spirit of the law of Congress. And why did we do that? Not, David Friedman, Donald Trump, Jared Kushner, Mike Pompeo never once read those reports in order to be able to decide what their policies were going to be. But Ambassador Friedman said, if there is a single report that comes out of this embassy that doesn't have my blessing, then that report can't leave the embassy because he understood the totality of the relationship was critical to fight each and every detail in order to be able to actually promote what U.S. interests are and not, you know, George Soros funded NGOs trying to craft U.S. policy. And I'm pleased to tell you, while the reports that came out this year are still terrible, they're at least more intellectually honest. And that means that you have the ability to litigate on the issues of those reports. And why does that matter? Because when they go up to the intelligence divisions, the State Department, the White House, they're able to be called BS, baloney, on what those reports actually have. So part number one is there's an entire industry of people, and it's not a small industry. It's hundreds, it's certainly tens of millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars since Oslo of NGOs who are created in order to determine what U.S. foreign policy is. Now, I make two arguments in the book. Argument number one is the day where foreign policy changed forever for the United States of America was December 6, 2017, when President Trump recognized Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, not the embassy, which is May 14th, which is the physical manifestation of that. But when President Trump recognized Jerusalem, the next day nothing happened. Suddenly, there was an awareness. Right? When I say nothing happened, every expert, and David Freeman writes about this in his book so eloquently and beautifully in Sledgehammer. And you should read it and you should buy it and you should buy more copies and you should give them to people. He litigates this case better than I ever could. And I got to watch him do this firsthand uh, for the better part of four years. And, uh, and he makes this argument. But at the end of the day, there was a risk, right? If the world blew up the next day, it would prove that Friedman and Kushner and Haley and Pompeo were wrong. And the swamp, to put that colloquially, was correct. And now what turns out to be right is that the people who were unqualified actually understood what was happening on the ground better than the so-called experts. And because that happened, all of the rest of the policies were able to flow forward from there because it was proven that the experts who claimed to be experts were indeed nothing but a cottage industry of people who were sitting there in order to only talk to each other, to get funding from each other, in order to produce more reports from each other, in order to establish a policy that we would be bound by. And the second we broke through that policy, they're like, oh my goodness, what is it that we actually do? What do we bring to the table? And that moment of aha, that was the eureka moment of the foreign policy establishment. Holy cow, these unqualified people might actually be onto something. <laughs> now, Here's what's critical, and I speak about this in the book at, at a fair amount of length. There were no repercussions for the experts. The experts were still invited to be talking heads in all the TVs. They were still invited to be the op-ed, not just on New York Times, but also in the Wall Street Journal, to go ahead and to claim their expertise that over, and whether the opening of the embassy, the recognition of the Golan Heights, the uh, deal of the century, even the Abraham Accords, these experts time and time again got to be considered experts while these unexperienced, underqualified people were doubted time and time again. And that's sort of point number one. I try to establish 
the the atmos- atmosphere that we were in. And once we established the atmosphere that we were in, then you can understand the greatness of what was accomplished. Um, and when we understand the greatness greatness of what was accomplished, that really comes through based upon the fact that the administration led by President Trump, but David Freeman, Jared Kushner, and Mike Pompeo were able to go over the experts, around the experts in order to make things happen. So that's the opening of the embassy, the recognition of Golan, et cetera. So why, why did I have to write this book? I wrote this book because from August 13th, 2020, which was the phone call in between MBZ, who was the crown prince of the UAE at that point in time, Mohammed bin Zayed, who's now the president of the UAE, uh, President Trump, and Prime Minister Netanyahu, if we can all just rewind our lives to back where we were in August of 2020, Black Lives Matter protests were destroying the foundation of Main Street throughout America. COVID and COVID policies prevented us from praying in synagogues and churches and mosques, but allowed us to protest whatever it was that we wanted. Um, there was a re-election campaign that was sort of happening, but sort of not happening. One of the candidates ran from his basement via Zoom, uh, and sort of all norms that we were used to got thrown out the window. In the midst of all of this, peace in the Middle East started breaking out. The problem is, is that for some of us, this was a priority, but for the vast majority of us, it wasn't. A lot of us had to figure out how to keep our businesses running how we were going to pray on the high holidays, when we were going to see our parents or grandparents or grandkids again. Uh, all of these things, I and mean, the world was in disarray in August of 2020. And I remember something that MBZ, that Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed said on the phone. And he said, you know, COVID did something to all of us. We're now going to do something to the world. And what he meant by that, if I'm allowed to interpret the words of Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed, he said, when COVID taught us that so much is out of our control, how much more do we have to do as leaders to take things that are in our control and to make a difference? And Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed decided that the region was not going to be forced to live in the past, and it was going to forge forth a new future. And, and the credit goes to the president and to Friedman and to Dermer and to Kushner and to Berkowitz and all those people. But there's one person who took a risk during the deal. And that risk was done by Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed. He had a cost-benefit analysis. He made that cost-benefit analysis. And just like President Trump pushed his chips to the middle of the table when he recognized Jerusalem, when he opened up the embassy, when he got out of the Iran deal, all of those had a cost-benefit. The person who had the cost, for the U.S. and Israel only had a benefit of the Abraham Accords, but there was a potential cost or risk that Mohammed bin Zayed took upon himself. And, and for us, as people who care about a strong U.S.-Israel relationship, we should recognize that he took a risk. We should recognize that he deserves that reward. And we should admire his leadership for that. And we as a Jewish community have not done enough to be able to recognize that. He, he doesn't need our investment. He doesn't need our money. He doesn't need our accolades. But when we tell our kids and our families about people who are determined to make the world a better place, he needs to be in our lexicon. And when we take a trip to go visit someplace, we go to Israel, we should fly a direct flight to Abu Dhabi, Dubai, or to Manama, Bahrain, or to Rabat, Morocco, just to say thank you. These leaders took a risk. And in that risk, they deserve that reward because the following thing, this is sort of how I conclude the book of Let My People Know. These countries are not fighting over religion so much anymore. They're not fighting over territory so much anymore, but they are competitive in terms of where they rank in terms of technology and military and intelligence and economics. And if there's a benefit to the Abraham Accords, then other countries will join it because they will act in their own interest. And if there is no benefit and there's only a risk, then why would another country take that specific risk? Uh, And sort of the final piece that I say in the book is that we as the United States of America, and this was my job for for the 123 days, that I got to be the special envoy for economic normalization, which meant to put the meat on the bones of the Abraham Accords, was how do I generate as much interest as humanly possible from the United States of America to give cover to these countries to be able to begin their relationships anew? So whether it was the first flight of El Al that flew from uh, from uh, Tel Aviv to, uh, um, to Abu Dhabi. Let me tell you about that flight, actually, for a second, then I'll pause and take questions. Uh, we got on that flight. It was the first ever commercial flight from Israel 
to UAE and it flew over Saudi Arabia. And when we're on the plane, we have the American delegation led by Jared Kushner and Robert O'Brien and Avi Berkowitz. We've got the Israeli delegation led by the National Security Advisor, Mayor Ben Shabbat. And we're all sitting on an LL 737. Uh, they have the painted flag. Now, the LL call signal was flight 971. Because if you dial the area code of the UAE, it starts with the 971. On the LL return flight from UAE back to um, Israel, it was call signal 972, which is Israel's area code, obviously. Uh, when we got onto that plane, the pilot made the announcement, welcome to the first ever flight of El Al from Israel to Abu Dhabi, flying over the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And you guys have been on countless flights. I promise you, you've never been on a flight that had a standing ovation on takeoff. We've all landed on flights that we wanted to have a standing ovation when we landed finally, but you've never had a standing ovation on takeoff. And even as I say this out loud, I've got the goosebumps of what it felt like in order to be on that plane as we traversed over Saudi Arabia and landed in Abu Dhabi. I mean, it was such a meaningful, fantastic experience, but nobody else can tell this story because it's unique to me. When we landed, I flew with an entire American delegation to Abu Dhabi. I was the only American who returned to Israel. The rest of Kushner's team went and they returned to America from Abu Dhabi. It was me and the Israeli delegation returned back to Israel. And we flew over Saudi Arabia that time as well, which was not a given. Saudi really gave Jared and Avi dispensation. It was unclear whether they were going to give us dispensation or not. They did, and all the credit to them for doing so. When we landed, also to great applause by all the Israelis and me, there was a stewardess on El Al. I even get choked up with this, so I apologize. And she takes the mic from the captain, said she's been flying for 42 years for El Al. She came out of retirement for this one special flight because she never thought that there would be a time that you would be able to fly El Al in the El Al uniform to take off from Israel to any Arab country and to be welcomed so royally. And uh, we gave her, obviously, a very large standing ovation. None of us got not been miles for the flight, which was really what I was concerned about. And, uh, and we went back with, uh, with our regular, you actually, believe it or not, part of that, we actually all went into quarantine for three days after that. Um, I mean, this was, this was, Ridiculous. One, one other story. I'm sorry. One other story from the, from the book that, uh, that, uh, that you have to see. So I, I only eat kosher. I wear my yarmulke everywhere that I go. Uh, on the first trip that I took to a Arab Muslim country was to Bahrain in 2019. And it was leading the peace to prosperity workshop in Manama. And my wife looks at me and says, Arya, you're not going to wear a yarmulke. I said, I'm going to wear a yarmulke because I represent the United States of America. She says, promise me when you're walking around without security, you're not going to wear a yarmulke. So, okay, my wife's letting me go. I will promise her that I will not wear a yarmulke uh, when I'm walking around without security. So we fly in to Bahrain, to fly to Bahrain. You have to stop in Saudi. I get to Saudi. It's time to pray the morning services. I'm like, what do I do? So I go out into the, into the gate while we're waiting for the connection flight. I'm like, okay. Like any airport I would in America, I take out my policy and fill in. And apparently I made the, uh, the, uh, the social media news in Saudi Arabia, <laughs> who was this guy putting on this Jewish stuff in the middle of the Riyadh airport? So that was that was my first introduction to uh, to Saudi social media. And I landed in Bahrain, and I had security, and I was fine. We walked around. They opened up the synagogue for us, uh, and we prayed Wednesday morning services in uh, in Bahrain as as guests of the king, which was really really special. And we go back fine. That was the sort of the end of the thing. My security drops us off at the airport in Manama, and they walk me through security like every airport has. And uh, and I tell the security guys, it's 2 in the morning, it's a 4 a.m. flight that I have to go home, go to sleep. And uh, so they leave. I'm in a secured area for the airport. And then suddenly I look around. There are only three flights that are taking off from the airport at this hour. There's a flight that goes to Afghanistan. There's a flight that goes to Pakistan. And there's a flight that goes to Turkey, which I was on. Because at that point in time, there were no direct flights from Bahrain to Israel. And I'm looking around, I'm like, oh my goodness, these guys are all going like to Afghanistan to fight ISIS. It looked like camp, like when you drop people off for birthright, just very, very different. So I'm like, okay, maybe now's the time that I have to follow my promise to my wife. So I'm looking around with which kippah I should possibly, uh, my, which hat I could wear instead of my kippah that I have on my head. And I look in my knapsack, the only hat I have is the United States Embassy Jerusalem. So uh, <laughs> I'm like, at that point in time, maybe I'll just keep the kippah on. And, and one of the Afghani guys saw me with the American flag on. And he goes, oh, we got to take a selfie. So there's some guy running around Afghanistan that has a selfie in my U.S. embassy 
Jerusalem hat and uh, and him off the whatever camp he was going to in the middle of Af- Afghanistan. So that was, you know, I try to bring people inside the room of what it was like as an Orthodox Jew, as a senior advisor to David Freeman, later on the special envoy to the Abraham Accords, let my people know that over the 123 days, the five normalization agreements we had with the UAE, with Bahrain, with Sudan, you if you buy the book, you'll read about what it was like when I negotiated the uh, the agreements with Sudan, along with my team, who was spectacular on behalf of Avi Berkowitz. Uh, we flew into Sudan secretly twice, uh, Morocco and Kosovo. So uh, hopefully you'll buy the book and read it. And I'm happy to answer any questions that uh, anybody wants to ask. Thank you so much, Rabbi Lightstone, uh, especially Envoy Lightstone. Uh, that was great. And the book is really absolutely terrific. Okay, I have a very important question for you. Um, how is peanut butter doing? <laughs> ah, now, now, okay. So I, I actually got a lot of grief for, for including the peanut butter chapter. So people know what the peanut butter chapter is. I'm going to give away the whole book. None of you guys are going to buy it. Okay. You guys all got to buy the book. Everybody buy the book. Uh, still. It's great. We, 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 we have to support peanut butter. So one of the things I try to explain is that the vast majority of people uh, who have these jobs don't normally have school age kids, meaning political appointees. Most of the time, they're much more seasoned and accomplished professionals. And their kids are high school, college, or even out of the house. Uh, when we took the job, my youngest was six, was 11 days old, uh, and my oldest was eight and a half years old. And so, you know, my wife, again, deserves all the credit because she brought the kids there and, and, and took care of them for four years when I sort of saw them on Shabbat sometimes. Uh, and uh, one of the things that we didn't realize, because we, we did not send our kids to the international American school. Rather, what we did is we sent our kids to the public school so our kids could learn Hebrew and, and acclimate with these Israeli people. And, uh, and uh, th- they had never had somebody work in the embassy beforehand. Uh, so I remember one time distinctly, I was on a secure call in a secure room talking to like an ambassador who really was besieged. It was our ambassador in Beirut. And at that point, um, Beirut's always bad, but this time was particularly bad. And we're sitting there talking about how we can de-escalate tensions. It's always funny when we both talk about it. It's not like Israel escalates the tensions. But nonetheless, we're having a conversation about how we can de-escalate the tensions. <laughs> And our Marine Sergeant, Gunnery Sergeant, who we call Gunny, who's our Chief Marine at the Embassy, comes bursting into the room and says, lights on, we have to speak right away. So that's terrifying because I was there four weeks. Nobody ever needed to speak to me right away. And uh, I go out of the room and Gunny's like, we think your daughter may have been kidnapped. I'm like, that is not good, <laughs> but probably unlikely. Um, I said, well, what's going on? Says, well, the school is screaming that she's been uh, she's, they're, they're holding her and they are starving her. I'm like, okay, I, I think I've got a premonition of what's going on. And I go outside and outside the secure room and outside the secure floor. And then you, you see your phone and I've got 11 missed calls from my wife and from the school. And, uh, so I call the school back on the official Marine, uh, phone and I'm speaking to the school secretary of the public school in Renana. And I say, hi, this is Ari Lightroom. Is my daughter okay? And they're like, yeah, your daughter's fine. She forgot to pack her lunch today. And we were calling the emergency number to tell you that she's starving. So with, with my Marine's understanding of Google Translate of the lady who was hysterically screaming into the phone that my daughter was crying because she forgot to pack a lunch, turned out to interrupt a pretty important meeting to tell me that my daughter may or may not have been kidnapped. Uh, so my daughter was not kidnapped, thank God. Uh, but she had a, uh, a um, um, she, <laughs> she, she was called from then on by the gunnery sergeant. Her nickname was Peanut Butter. Uh, my nickname was Tip of the Spear because I always had to show up places before the ambassador got there. Uh, had we known what the ambassador's book would have been called, I would have been called Tip of the Sledgehammer. But uh, anyway, that was my nickname was Tip of the Spear and Shana was Peanut Butter. None of the rest of the family got a nickname. But uh, uh, anyway, she also did not forget her lunch again after that. Thanks, Liz, so think, much. Yeah. Thanks so much. Uh, by the way, everybody, um, if you'd like to ask a question, um, please either raise your hand, use the raise your hand function or put your question in the chat or let us know in the chat that you'd like to ask your question live. And uh, I just wanted to also say, I, my first question was going to be about the NGOs and I'm so glad you discussed that because those are huge pet peeve of ours. I mean, they, they are a disaster and you know, the current reports are, you know, I mean, they right away start in with, you know, uh, talking about the allegations of, uh, Yesh Din and, and uh, uh, B'Tselem and all these really horrible uh, Soros-funded, European government-funded uh, NGOs that spend all day uh, blasting Israel and that, that just ends up in the State report, Department reports as, as Shonda. And I'm, I'm really glad that you took this on. 
we're uh, in office. You know, it's very much appreciated. And it, unfortunately, it's back to, uh, you know, back to the same, a lot of the same business again now within the current administration. And, you know, that, that must be, I'm sure it's very upsetting to you to, to see what's going on now in those reports. Um, can, I, can I make one comment on that? Sure, sure. Yeah. So this is important for everybody to know. We, we unfortunately, today we see a rise in anti-Semitism. Many of us live in fairly insulated lives where it does not impact us directly, uh, even though that's becoming more and more to the surface. But let me give you, let me, let me paint one picture. I'll keep the country anonymous because I, I likely saw this when I had some form of, it was likely some form of classification. <laughs> and it's not in the book, so I didn't get it cleared by the White House. But Israel was in the middle of negotiating a free trade agreement with a country that it had recent relations with, not the new, new relations, but it was a country in Asia that they were doing a free trade agreement with. The Europeans called that country and said, now in free trade agreements with Israel, there's Israel, Jerusalem, the Golan Heights, and the West Bank. And each one of those entities for the rest of the world needs an independent free trade agreement. And most of the rest of the world will only do an agreement with Israel excluding Jerusalem, the Golan Heights, and the Judea and Samaria or the West Bank. That's how most of the world has their agreements with Israel. Um, mostly because the United States also had our agreements with Israel in that way up until, uh, again, you've got PT, PT, and T up to the time of, of President Trump. Um, there was this country who could not care less about Jerusalem or Golan Heights or Judea and Samaria. They, they just wanted a free trade agreement with Israel because they believe that Israel and their economic superpowerness is going to propel their country to the top of their competitive issue that they have in Asia. And so they wanted a warm embrace with Israel. And so they didn't have any political shenanigans in their free trade agreement. This was being negotiated between Israel and this country. I don't know how this has happened, but a European country found out that this agreement was going to happen without the traditional political exclusion of Jerusalem, Golan Heights, and Judea and Samaria. And they called up that country and said, we will cancel our free trade agreement with you if you don't have a free trade agreement with Israel that excludes Jerusalem, the Golan Heights, and Judea and Samaria. Now, I just have to ask you, what type of anti-Semite wakes up in the morning and decides that another country in Asia's relationship with Israel bothers them so badly that they will cancel their relationship with them? Just, just explain to me what type. I wish we all had that motivation for anything in life. You wake up in the morning, you care so deeply about hating. It's got to be the Jewish people hating the state of Israel so badly. That none, none of the, the, the country that this person comes from is far from perfect. I promise you, his or her job representing that country, it, he's not doing a great job representing that country. There's other stuff they can fix there rather than deciding that the Asian country working on a free trade agreement with Israel needs to have political exclusion. So this is what we're up against. And when the United States of America does not speak clearly and definitively about what it is that we believe in, then you wind up with shenanigans like this. And this happened on our watch. Uh, now, again, they likely wouldn't have followed through with it because we had Friedman, Pompeo, Kushner, Berkowitz, and all the rest of the people. Oh, I will say one more thing. I don't get into this nearly, in a nearly enough detail for the book, but if you just look at the people who worked in the previous administration, nearly every one of them would have been that MVP, the most valuable player for the U.S.-Israel relationship uh, in any other administration. The secretaries of energy specifically deserve a shout out. Rick Perry, uh, who many of you are familiar with. Dan Bruyette, who most of you are probably not familiar with. He was the secretary of the, tre of the energy for the second half. He was a ardent supporter of the Abraham Accords, a very sp a significant supporter of Israel's energy independence, and was a major fighter for Israel's uh, opportunities in uh in in the region and if you if you if you remember um when uh when the president of egypt went to the israeli minister of energy just six weeks ago eight weeks ago who's in a wheelchair and he went and gave her special attention uh which normally wouldn't happen in egypt the relationship there the foundation of that relationship came from dan Briette. Uh, he doesn't get nearly enough credit from our community. He deserves it. He, he, in any other administration, everybody would have pointed to that guy and said, he's the champion of the U.S.-Israel relationship. But th there was not a shortage 
of them in the previous administration. I'm not going to comment on the current administration. Uh, what did you say? Well, we, we have not hesitated to comment about the uh, appointees in the current administration. In fact, we have a whole uh, web page. Um, Biden hostile to Israel appointment watch, which was one after another, who was extremely problematic. You know, people who run run, run conferences on how to demonize Israel, um, the uh, main uh, contact with the Pal Palestinians, who uh, said that he was inspired by the Intifada, and it goes on and on. It's you know, it's an absolute disaster. Um, I have a lot of questions in the chat, so I'll read some of them to you. Um, oh, no. Great friend Nathan Lewin um, uh, is asking, do you want to tell the story of how the State Department changed its policy of refusing to recognize for you uh, for, on the U.S. passports, place of birth designation that Jerusalem is in, in Israel? Nathan, of course, is, uh, that, uh, was before the uh, U.S. Supreme Court uh, on this case. And, he was, was a big fighter for, for this. So ZOA uh, actually initiated the first uh, legal case on this on this matter, and we combined forces. So uh, this is something that I'm sure people would love to hear about this uh, ultimate success in the, during the Trump administration. I I I am uh, <laughs> I'm humbled that Nathan would ask me. Uh, th th there are a lot of heroes to this story, and Nathan, Aliza, uh, David Milstein. I think you guys are familiar with David Milstein here at ZOA. Well, yeah. um, Certainly David Friedman, Mike Pompeo, uh, the, the list of people relevant to that way above where my relevance is, is, is a long list. And I'm, I'm proud uh, that it's a long list. I, I was I was when my job was to be a cheerleader, I was very excited to be a cheerleader. Uh, and uh, Nathan, Aliza, ZOA, David Milstein, David Friedman, Mike Pompeo got it done. Uh, I won't tell you how it happened. I'll let Nathan and Aliza share that because I don't want to mess up. Uh, the intricate part of the decades long battle. But I will tell you that where there was an opportunity for flair, we tried not to miss it. So there was no coincidence that we opened up the embassy on May 14th at 4 11 p.m., 70 years to the minute of Harry Truman's recognition of the state of Israel. Uh, there was no coincidence that the very first passport that was issued uh, that says born in Jerusalem, Israel, uh, to a U.S. citizen went to the Zivotovskis who fought alongside Lewin and ZOA and the rest of the champions of what was right. And, uh, and in nearly any other timing, again, COVID and, and sort of the rest of it, um, it likely would have been a front page of the Wall Street Journal, New York Post type of story. Uh, and you know what happened? Nothing, which is great. The best part of all is I'll give you just another example to that. And, and, and maybe, maybe it's, I never looked at this as, as, as deflating. I always looked at this as very exciting. Uh, on the one year anniversary of President Trump's recognition of Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, I arranged for a surprise joint candle lighting at the Western Wall of the Kotel and between Prime Minister Netanyahu and Ambassador David Friedman. Believe it or not, in the entire history of the state of Israel, that is the first time that any diplomat ever from any Western country went to the Western Wall with any Prime Minister of Israel. That was the first time ever uh, on the fourth night of Hanukkah 2018. And it was, man, were our security people petrified. I mean, really, really nervous. How could it be? You're going there with this. And and, and they shut down the whole Kotel Plaza. It was like presidential level security, uh, which ambassadors don't normally get. Our ambassador got a lot of security, but not presidential level security. And we sat there one year later at the Israel Hayom, the Israel Today conference, literally one, well, less than one year later, nine, nine months later, uh, in June of 2019, with Nikki Haley, Jason Greenblatt, David Friedman, Lindsey Graham, uh, and the Prime Minister of Israel and so many others from the Israeli cabinet uh, sat there, and do you know what the news report said? Nothing. Do you know why they said nothing? Because it makes sense. The United States of America, to go there proudly and prominently with the leadership of Israel, regardless of the party of who the leadership of Israel comes from, it just makes sense. And the proof is, it's not news. It really is not news. It's, it, it, it's news, and this is sort of what the book argues, and let my people know, 
it should be news how ridiculous we were for 70 years, afraid of our own shadow, afraid of our ability to do what was correct, and, and lacking the courage and convictions to stand up for what existed outside of the echo chamber of the foreign policy world. So uh, Aliza and, and, and Nathan and, and all the rest of the heroes who fought that for 20 years, you know what happened the day after Zivotovsky got his passport? Some other guy got or gal got their passports that said born in Jerusalem. And uh, it's normal. And that's the best part of all of this. It should be normal and it, it must be normal. So uh, I really wish them congratulations. You helped us look good. But we, we other than Friedman and Milton, I, I did nothing. But I appreciate I was in a bunch of good pictures. So thank you. Thanks. And uh, as Mel also mentioned, uh, David Friedman spoke about uh, the issue in his book also. So there's more and more info in there. Um, and we're hoping to have him uh, come and do, do a, a book club with us too. Um, let's see, uh, Brian Grodman uh, has some questions. Uh, Brian is a COA board member. And he asked, did David want, number one, did David Friedman suggest to the Israeli government uh, to build in Judea and Samaria and E1, it seems an, an opportunity has been missed. And his second question was, were there non-public co communications with the government of Iran? Well, I didn't hear the second question, say again. Were there non-public communications with the government of Iran? That's a good thing I didn't hear the second question because I'm not gonna address the second question. Uh, the first question, uh, I, I'm, I'm happy to address. David Friedman said this so incredibly articulately, and this is, this is uh, disappointing to hear that, uh, that in advance of, of President Biden's arrival, that they decided to cancel building in Israel. Uh, that, that is disappointing. Um, but I'm not in the room, and I'm not part of all the conversations that are happening today. I'm not. I was in the room for many of the conversations. Uh, then, but one of the conversations that David and Jason Greenblatt, who has a book that's coming out soon, I'm sure it's going to be fantastic. Uh, Jared Kushner, Pence Pompeo, again, the, the list. I, I'm just embarrassed to leave somebody off the list. The list is really impressive. Uh, list. Asked Israel to, to, my argument was Israel's greatest sovereignty was given to it by the Trump administration because it said, Israel, you figure out what's best for Israel. And if it makes sense for us, we'll support it. And most of the time it does. And if it doesn't make sense for us, we won't support it. So I'll give you a better example of that with China. Israel has a major China issue. So we, we, we didn't bully them and I didn't browbeat them. I said, look, here's why we think China is a threat. We don't think you're educated enough on this issue. You're your own independent country. And you're gonna have to make your own independent decisions. <laughs> but depending on how you come out on that, the United States of America is going to have its own opinion. So just add that to your calculus. But Israel should come up with what is best for Israel. If you decide that China is going to be your top ally, so go in this particular direction. If you want us to be your top ally, you just have to understand that every time Ambassador Friedman or anybody else goes back into President Trump's Oval Office and makes a case about Israel and in the news is yet another solar uh, project or another desalinization plant is, is going to the Chinese, just decide whether that's in your interest or not. And then decide when Chinese are investing in your dual use technology. Do you think they're doing it because they think you're really handsome? Or do you think they're doing it because they're gonna steal your IP like they do it for everybody else? Just decide, I mean, that, that's, it's Israel's decision. You're entitled to make whatever decision you wanna make. And that's what I mean by sovereignty. Israel had the ability to make its own decisions regarding building. Um, America was going to react in different ways based upon different things. But Israel had to make its own calculation. The, the, the biggest challenge with Israel making its own calculation we were never privileged to work with an Israeli government that had a significant enough majority to make meaningful, significant decisions. Uh, and so therefore Israel uh, on its own needs to, I think, decide. And, and, and uh, Ambassador Friedman wrote a beautiful op-ed not that long ago, or maybe this was his speech that he gave to Tikva. Um, once upon a time, I could tell you side and verse where he is and even how he slept that night. Now I just get to really speak to him. So I, I can't tell you specifically, but sometime last six weeks, he wrote a, 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 or gave a great speech about the fact that Israel needs to figure out what it wants to be when it grows up. And uh, the United States of America is likely to support that vision, but Israel shouldn't rely on the United States of America for that vision because we're not Israeli. They should come up with that vision, they should develop it, they should figure out risks and rewards, and then have that vision and, and, and march towards it. And they should make their case to the United States of America. I'm sure that they have specific administrations that they would be most interested in making that case too, but they should make that case and they should stick with it. Because America will respect, it might not like, but it will respect 
a country that wants to have a vision and, and has the ability to follow through on that. Israel hasn't yet done that meaningfully. Thank you so much. Um, Britta Rafsky had a quick question. Um, I guess you, uh, you know, if you could clarify it, it's just, you know, why, uh, what is if, if you ask something, it seems like you cut out. I don't know if that's part. my, oh, I don't okay. know. I don't know if it's my service or yours, but I missed that question. I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. No, the question was why one of why one of your um, uh, assignments lasted only four months. The one related to the Abraham Accords, enhancing that. And I think it's just the timing of you know how things. Yeah, happen. we we got fired. Right. We started on August 13th, uh, 2020, and that was the first phone call. And in 123 days, five peace agreements, over 100 and I think 30 MOUs signed, uh, and uh, and relationships took off like nobody's business. Uh, and then January 20th came around and at 6.48 PM, I resigned. Uh, interesting thing, when I was hired, I was hired as uh, David Freeman's senior advisor. <laughs> when I resigned, I resigned first and foremost as the senior advisor. It was the position that I cherished the most, but I was also the director of an investment fund called the Abraham Fund that was supposed to spur on the economic opportunities from the Abraham Accord. And I also retired as the, or resigned, as a special envoy for economic normalization, which was also supposed to connect those things. I think I resigned from one other thing that I'm forgetting right now. And that wasn't because I was necessarily the, the best at anything. It was, <laughs> if you remember August 2020, there weren't that many people who were running around looking to take on additional responsibilities. So I was there and I, I, I enjoyed every moment. Uh, you should know that everybody on the Abraham Accord team worked until 6.45 p.m. Israel time on January 20th. Uh, we 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 ran out the clock. We left nothing on the field, if that makes sense. And we left. The Freedmans invited both the Lightstones and David Milstein. Uh, we finished at the Kotel at 6:45. I guess we could have gone to the Kotel at 7 p.m., but we went 15 minutes early, and that was the end of our uh, the end of our job. Uh, David Friedman started at the Kotel and ended at the Kotel. Um, I started in Herzliya, but I ended at the Kotel, so I feel like I was following him. That's beautiful. Um, I'm, uh, we have uh, Eugene Greenstein. Greenstein has his hand raised, and I'm going to ask him to uh, Eugene, Can you unmute yourself? Yes. Uh, my question is: is that President Trump is not portrayed very positively? Uh, what's your perception of Pre President Trump since you had uh, some real world dealings with him? Great question. Uh, believe it or not. Uh, when every group came, I'll give, I'll give you, I'll give you a story. And it's also not in the book. You guys are getting a lot. Uh, um, there was a group that came into the embassy in 2019. So pre COVID. And, uh, and one of the things that people like to do was take a picture by the plaque because the plaque was pretty cool and, uh, take a picture by the plaque. And there was a lady in the group, um, who, uh, who looked at the plaque and had just this moment of revulsion that she was going to have a picture with someone that had Donald Trump's name on it. And she walks out and screams, not scream. She harumphs, not my president. So that's fine. I wasn't going to let it ruin the mood for everybody else. So we take the picture. She's not in the picture. We go into the ambassador's office and I'm briefing this group of 18 or 20 people. But I couldn't get through my head the not my president line. And I decided instead of giving the normal U.S.-Israel speech, I decided to speak about one of my heroes in the embassy. And there are, I think, 500 of them around the world, maybe a couple more. It's the operator at our embassies and consulates, the person who picks up the phone when you need something as an American in any place in the world. And you call and the operator picks up and there was a lady named Avril, which is British accent, who picked up from our embassy. She fielded thousands of phone calls a week, thousands of phone calls a week. And you know what she didn't ask? She did not ask who you voted for. She did not ask if you voted. She didn't ask if you're current on your taxes. She didn't ask if you committed any zoning violations. She said, are you American? And if you were American, you were put to one course of phone calls. And if you weren't, you went into a pile that we got back to you eventually, right? If you're American, and this isn't just the embassy in Jerusalem or the consulate in Tel Aviv or any of the other, this is every single place that we have throughout the world. And, and you know what? Donald Trump is all of our president when he was the president. Today, Joe Biden is all of our president. This is not my president in Harumpton. So... People like to ask me about that a lot. And my answer was, I interacted with him personally less than 15 times. He was always very kind and polite to me. 
Uh, I saw him when he was very happy. I saw him when he was very angry. Um, and I saw him take his job extremely seriously. David Friedman is a 25-year-old friend with him. Jared Kushner is his son-in-law. Mike Pompeo worked with him daily. Uh, they'll know much better what that was like. I will only tell you the following thing. The policies that I was involved with, he was involved with, he was supportive of, and he allowed us to change the region for the rest of eternity with the Abraham Accords. And for that, I'll be forever grateful. Um, are there things that he could have done differently? Absolutely. Are there things that he could have done better? Also, absolutely. Um, but uh, the things that I was deeply involved with, uh, I, I never had a poor interaction with him. Uh, and the policies that he articulated were policies that when everybody forgets, you know, Jewish history is a funny thing. We're a people of the book. We remember back, you know, Jerusalem 3,000 years ago. We remember back to Abraham 4,000 years ago. When they read the story in 1,000 years from now, they'll remember him like Cyrus, as the person who made the right decisions with tremendous courage and conviction at the time where nobody else thought that he would. And for that, I'll be forever grateful on those issues. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Nadine Gerson is asking a question, which I'm sure a lot of us are very curious about. What other countries are expected to join the, this effort, which I believe she's referring to the Abraham Accords? <laughs> so I'll, I'll, I'll answer that in my diplomatic way, which is by not answering it, but I'll answer it, it two different things. Number one is, if you remember August 13th, 2020 at 10 a.m., the phone call happened at 11.05 a.m., the press reported on it. There's not a soul in the world who wasn't read into that deal, who knew what was happening. And there was a reason for that. And I discussed this in the book. There are people who really like peace processes where there's a process and we just do things for decades on end, but we don't actually change anything because it's a great industry. And there are people who actually want to get peace done. Uh, the effective way to get peace done is by getting it done. And then you tell people that it happened. And there's a lot of different reasons for it, but with Middle East negotiations, that gives the leadership of all the countries in the Middle East the greatest flexibility and room to be able to do what they need to do in order to make courageous and bold decisions. So if I did know the answer, I wouldn't share the answer. But you, now you know why I wouldn't share the answer. But the second answer to that is it goes back to the cost-benefit analysis. There is not a country in the broader Middle East, North Africa region who today is not making a calculation. It might not be the president, the prime minister, or the foreign minister, but there's somebody in their cabinet who is saying, is there a appropriate ratio of benefit to cost for us to normalize with Israel? And they're just waiting and watching. And that benefit can come from the United States. It can come from the broader Jewish community. It will come from Israel. And that's all they're doing. They're weighing the basket of the opportunities. But I will tell you, I believe, I don't know this actually. I haven't met with all the leaders. I don't even pretend to have met with all the leaders. But the people I've spoken to is a pretty robust group of people. I believe pretty strongly that every country is saying when and not if. And if you can just remember, John Kerry's famous three no's, right, was, was, was strengthening the other countries who would say only if and not when. And with just the leadership of a very brief four, year, four years and then 123 days of the Abraham Accords, all of the lexicon in the Middle East has changed. The question of when and not if. And I think that's pretty cool. So we, we, need to, we need to represent the United States of America. We need to be aggressive in, in securing our allies and pushing back our foes. And uh, more, more countries will join. It's a question of when and not if. Thank you so much. Um, I think we'll just do maybe one or two more questions and then, and then wrap up. I, by the way, I wanted to mention that in the chat, we have a lot of people uh, just thanking you for your service and for your book and for this excellent presentation. You know, a lot of wonderful comments. Um, That's so nice. Thank you. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, we have uh, from Phyllis Rodin. Um, I hope I uh, Rodin. <laughs> Rodin. <laughs> uh, Rabbi, do you think there is a, a, a dangerous chance that Lapid will push a two-state agreement through? Uh, and she says, so good to see you. It's great to see you. It's so nice to get a question from you. Long time no speak. Uh, look, Yair Lapid is the prime minister. The relationship that the United States of America has with Israel is with Israel. And Israel's a robust democracy, and they should pick their leaders. This is sort of a funny caretaker leadership. I don't anticipate anything transformational happening, good or bad, in the next three months. 
Uh, I pray for the safety of Israel. Transformational governments of all kinds uh, come with risk. And uh, I hope that God gives them the wisdom to be able to steer correctly during this time. Um, that being said, I, I really hope that Israel comes up with a very strong government that will be able to make meaningful, courageous decisions, because uh, that'll be good. And Israel needs to determine what it's going to do. The will of the Israeli people is not in a two-state solution today, certainly not in, in what colloquially is known as that. Um, and so I'm not, I'm not particularly concerned about anything. I, the, the American press, I think, will wake up and be pretty interested to find out that Yair Lapid's foreign policy regarding Iran, et cetera, is not terribly different than Bibi's foreign policy regarding on a, on, a, on a top level. The way it's articulated is very different from everything else like that. But the people of Israel do not want Iran to have a bomb. The people of Israel do not want to get shot uh, or stabbed, whether it's an Ariel, Neve, Daniel, Afrat, or Tel Aviv. And the people of Israel want peace and security, and they want more Abraham Accord countries. There are details to be worked out. But just as I'm not going to bully Israel when it's government A or government B, the Israeli people will pick a government to represent them. I hope, look, I don't know how many of us read the Bible, but those of us who read the Tanakh understand that the only thing that has historically destroyed the Jewish people when we've had our homeland is disunity. Um, I hate the rhetoric during election season. Uh, I really, really hate that. It makes me feel embarrassed. Uh, as a Jew, as a Jewish American, but we, we shouldn't talk to each other this way. Look, Americans shouldn't talk to each other this way in our political rhetoric. There is not a human being, um, there's not a Jew who has existed throughout history who would not trade places with every single one of us. And, and we sit here as, as though the world is falling. There are a lot of problems, there are a lot of issues, and we need to fight them, but we need to fight them civilly and we need to fight them politely and we need to elevate the conversation, not denigrate the conversation. I'm very proud DOA does that a lot and, and, and we all need to do that. We need to stay involved, we need to push, we need to work, uh, but Israel needs to come up with its government and we need to come up with our government and, and we need to all elevate the discourse and we should pray for unity in Israel. That, that's a good thing, not a bad thing. Sorry, I don't even know if that answered the question, but that's what I felt like telling you guys. And then we have a, qu a question from Leslie Berger about the State Department's uh, unfortunate history of uh, not being very positive towards Israel and uh, asking how much opposition did you face from the State Department? I know in the book you talked about problems with the initial um, uh, Secretary of State, Rex Tillerson, DOA pointed out issues with him <laughs> too. And we uh, were thrilled when, uh, you know, we also supported Pompeo, uh, Pompeo against uh, some left wing group who tried to not have him confirm. Um, and, you know, Pompeo did a you know phenomenal job. Uh, I, I know you, you spoke about Rex Tillerson not doing what uh, you know he should have done on uh, getting more con uh, countries to open embassies. In Look, he, he 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 didn't do what you're supposed to do, which is work for the boss, right? It, it, he's he's a secretary of state. He wasn't elected. He was appointed. The president had a policy. He didn't like the policy, but you support the policy or you leave. Uh, in terms of the State Department. In terms of any other career bureaucrat, uh, look, they look at political, uh, I'm saying overgeneralizing, some of my very good friends worked with me. I think many of them disagreed with me uh, and disagreed with Ambassador Friedman. But most of the people that I worked with in the embassy were intelligent, hardworking, pardon me, and were willing to do the policies that were articulated. Um, not all of them. Some were obstinate and some tried to, to make the policies fail, but that was a minority. The State Department writ large, and we don't have time to discuss this right now, there are a lot of reasons that could be justified from their own internal thinking in terms of why they have an anti-Israel bias. Here's the thing. We're not going to fix that. What we need to do is we need to be confident in who we are. We need to be confident in what it is that we do. And when we have an eye on the target, we cannot get distracted. And that comes from Americans. We have to know what we would do in any future administration. We articulate and we make our case time and time again. Let my people know is about that. It's just, peace in the Middle East is not a Republican issue. It's not a Democratic issue. It's an American issue. And the fact that this administration hasn't picked that up and run with that is a disservice to America. They shouldn't be faulted that they don't want to run with Trump's policy. They should be faulted that they're not running with an American policy. It's an America's interest. And, and, and we need to do a better job of saying it's it's America. We benefit. And we don't do a good enough job articulating why that is. Put, put America, Republican or Democrat, into a box and make them make the right decisions. And when they don't make the right decisions, explain not why it's not good for Israel. Explain why it's not good for America. They weren't elected to support Israel. They were elected to support Amer uh, America. They were appointed to their jobs. They joined the Foreign Service for that. 
We have to do a better job of articulating that, which, by the way, uh, Sledgehammer should be mandatory reading for anybody who ever works for foreign policy in any United States of America. Then not everyone's going to agree with it, but at least they'll see a side that I promise you they've never heard before. I think that your book should be mandatory reading for anybody who works in foreign policy too, <laughs> particularly in the Middle East. Very, it's that very kind. Thank you. And I hope that everybody will buy your book also. Um, but I, I also hope everybody will buy my book. <laughs> you and I are on the same page with that. <laughs> By the way, I am uh, also pleased to let everybody know we don't have the date set yet, but that Jason Greenblatt um, has uh, agreed to speak about uh, his book uh, of about the uh, the Trump administration in his time there. He was also uh, in one of the special envoys, very involved in, in the Abraham Accords. And uh, uh, you know, I think it, I think that'll probably be late August or early September. So watch for our announcement on that. Um, and are you, um, I, I guess, Alan, are you there? Uh, oh wait, you know, are you, why don't I give you a chance to, uh, you know, for any final comments you'd like to make? And then Alan, I'll have a few more, uh, my colleague, Alan Jay, you'll have a few more announcements. Right. And, and you can, by the way, you can share my email. I see that like David, there, there's several people who had questions. If, if there's a way that I can help that, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to answer. This is exciting. You guys, you guys are the ambassadors for the U.S.-Israel relationship today. As ZOA put out a book, it will be called I Told You So, uh, which shows how, how oftentimes they're in the front. And, and that I, I, would, I would only say that let's, ele let's elevate everybody together. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it is... We're in interesting times. We're in complicated times. We're in challenging times. And, and President Biden landed in Israel today. And yeah, I don't like a lot of his policies. And I don't. But the president of the United States of America went to Israel. Let's let's. That's awesome. We should be excited about that. Now, whether the results are good or bad, let's litigate that tomorrow. Uh, but today, let's celebrate the fact that there is a very strong relationship in between the U.S. and Israel. The previous president broke all ceilings for that. And the advantage is is that that'll elevate all future presidencies. And we need to make sure that every future president on the Republican side and the Democratic side understands why what President Trump achieved is the floor for all future administrations, not because it's good for Israel. Take off your Israel hat, but because it's good for America. And we need to make that case time and time again. And on occasion, we get caught up by saying what's good for Israel. If we can articulate that, the U.S.-Israel relationship is uniquely fantastic for the United States of America, we will take our group and we will expand it and elevate it meaningfully. And that ultimately will let my people know is if, if you think that you have a friend who says, man, Trump did nothing right. I'm sure none of you guys know any of those people, but there are a couple of people who, who, who may believe that. Buy my book, send them the book and explain. You know, people used to explain brain surgery and peace in the Middle East, the two things that couldn't get done. Uh, nobody should entrust me with brain surgery. Uh, frankly, nobody shouldn't trust me with peace in the Middle East either. You should give all the credit to the president and to Jared and to David and to Avi and to Pompeo and to Pence. But uh, but uh, somebody who got a chance to run around and do some pretty cool things. Uh, you know, most people don't know me well enough to hate me. So you can give your book to people who didn't like the previous president. They'll say, my goodness, there's peace, five peace treaties, 130 some MOUs. And, and uh, it's fantastic. So I, I love being with you guys. Uh, I hope to see you guys many, many, many times. I hope you guys buy many, many of my books this week. Uh, it would be fantastic if uh, by the time Biden comes back, we're on a top 10 list of people who say, wow, that's how Middle East policy could be. Uh, so uh, don't be bashful about that. And normally I don't promote myself, but I'm going to take advantage of this now. Go for it. Um, would you like to tell everybody your uh, email address? Or, or Yeah, so you can you can get me at Lightstone, which is my last name, A-N, so Arye Natan, but A-N, like Nancy, or Natan at gmail.com. And that's set up for the book. So I'm happy to answer speaking requests or questions, stuff like that. There, as long as they're not an emergency, normally I'll fill out, I'll, I'll respond once a week to, to that inbox because it fills up pretty quickly. But lifestone an at gmail.com. Thank, thanks. Thank you so much, Ari. Ari this, is, this has been phenomenal, really. Just a wonderful presentation. Um, Alan, uh, yeah. could you uh, uh, tell everybody some uh, announcements? I will, but first I just want to tell people that we did have a technological glitch. If you weren't able to raise your hand or post your question, you weren't alone. So please don't feel slighted. We'll work on that before the next program. Rabbi, you're very modest. I will not allow that. Thank you for everything that you <laughs> did to make this stunning, stunning um, policy come into, into reality. I am also going to suggest to uh, ZOA President Mort Klein your proposed title for a book. I love it. I told you so. It's fantastic.
And we do have a few programs coming up. Um, one, the day isn't set yet, but we are going to be hosting New York City Councilwoman uh, Inna Vernikoff, who will speak about anti-Semitism at CUNY and on college campuses. She'll be interviewed uh, with by ZOA uh, Center for Law and Justice Director Susan Tuckman. Uh, we have a ZOA Donor Society program scheduled with Brigadier uh, General Amir Avivi in our home office in New York. That's a Donor Society event on Thursday, July 28th. So if you qualify, if you want to know if you qualify, reach out to me. You all have my contact information. Uh, and Liz, that's probably all that I have other than we could really use financial support always. We've got a lot of work to do. Uh, Rabbi pointed out some of the good work that we're doing. Thank you for the accolades, Rabbi. We accept them graciously. Uh, and we do need your support. So whenever you can, folks, go to our website, zoa.org, hit the donate button and help us out. Thank you. Now, I'll mention two other programs. So if you don't have dates yet for, um, you know, one is, I, I mentioned earlier, that we'll be having Jason Greenblatt um, speaking about his, his new book, and uh, probably in late August or September. So watch out for it in our emails. And also, um, uh, Mort and I will, Mort Klein and I will probably be doing a talk about the chapter we wrote uh, for the Kasdan Institute's book on uh, Trump's policy and, and its impact on American Jewry. Um, we uh, wrote a uh, you know, very favorable uh, a chapter uh, going through both policies uh, affecting uh, Israel and, and policies affecting American Jewry. Um, and we're also going to be, I'm also going to be in a panel about that in late October. Um, but uh, that should be an interesting program. We don't have the date yet set for that, but uh, you know, please tune in. And as Alan said, we very much appreciate your support and could use your support. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>